Um, if you need to dive away early, please do. If you need me to hurry up and get to the interesting bit, then tell me. <laughs> um, oops, sorry, I'm just there we go. Um, let's finish. Talking about there we go. Um, get rid of that and that and that. Perfect. So just start for now. We are recording. Um, and thank you so much as well for uh giving up your Tuesday evening to um be with us. Hopefully you'll find um this training quite interesting and looks like a few of you definitely are safeguarding needs so you are in the right place uh, which is always a good start um so yeah Owen I'll hand over to you wonderful great um can people see the um the slides that I've got up as well can see something excellent good um, yes. so yeah I've I was just saying to Veronica I've been intending to talk for you know what half an hour or so and then there should be time for questions or but I'm very happy for you to jump in as we go along um I might ask you to tell me what you think at some point um in which case either you can unmute and just shout in because there's only a few of you um or do um put something in the chat if you're able and Grace will relay that even if I'm busy doing something else um as many of you will know, we try and do a monthly um, webinar themed around safeguarding in its in its broadest sense. Um, and I think the session title we've taken of Train the Trainers is really just kind of putting back on the agenda the idea that safeguarding training is something that we all share a responsibility for. Um, and with a little bit of support from us, there's stuff that you can and potentially should be doing um, locally to keep that on the agenda and make sure, particularly you as safeguarding leads or group leaders, for those of you who are, um, are making sure that you're supporting your volunteers locally, the people that you work with day to day running your groups, um, to be fully aware of what their what their roles and responsibilities are and also to help them be feel equipped to deal with anything that they're likely to come across as a as a volunteer in craft. Um, so what we will do is we will, as as has become traditional, revisit the basic definitions and make sure we're all on the same page. We'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to achieve when we run the safeguarding training. We'll look at what you could be doing. Um, to train people locally. Um, we will look at the resources that um, we've made available uh, to support groups running their own volunteer training. Um, and then we've all, we will also look at other places that you can go for more, more ideas and, and, and support. I hope that's okay. Um, if you want me to focus on one of those things more than the other, by all means, do shout up when we get to that and we can we can take a little diversion as they're not huge numbers of people. Um, so just to make sure that we are we are happily all talking about the same thing, when we talk about safeguarding, we're talking about a much more holistic approach. We're talking about everything that we do that makes sure that our children and young people have got the best outcomes um, and they are happy and safe and protected when they are engaging with us and in their family and home and domestic and social lives when they're away from the craft folk. Um, that might be about pretend, pretend, preventing them from maltreatment or neglect or something that's going to harm their health or development. Um, and it might be about protecting them from, from an external source of, uh, of danger or abuse. Um, within that, there is a subsection of the safeguarding approach, which is child protection, which is that activity that we take reactively to protect a specific child or children because we believe that they are suffering or likely to suffer significant harm. Um, that is one part of our wider safeguarding approach. It's what people often sort of their minds fly to when we think of safeguarding training, knowing what to do in a child protection scenario. But realistically, um, 90% of the time, what we're doing when we are safeguarding our children and young people 
is about providing that safe and holistic environment. 10% of the time, we are either dealing with or preparing to deal with um, responding to HR protection scenario, but you never know when it's going to be just around the corner. It could pop up at any time, at any green light, and it's important we are prepared. Um, so as most of you will be aware, there is kind of lots of stuff that we do within Woolcraft that is part of our wider safeguarding approach to make sure that the people that we put in front of our children and young people are the right ones, to make sure that we can support and care for the children when we're running activities with them, to ensure that there are safe procedures and policies in place, um, to ensure that people know what they're doing, to protect our volunteers from false allegations and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's just some of the stuff. So having informed parent and consent, carer consent, having health emergency contacts and things like that for the children that we are working with, having DBS or PVG checks in charge for our, um, our volunteer, in place for our volunteers, making sure that we're meeting sensible adult to child ratios at our sessions and so on and so forth. Um, so that is, you know, the totality of, 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 you know, of everything that we do within Woodcraft to keep people safe involves more than just the things that you might talk about on a safeguarding training for people who have a particular role. And I guess your challenge is to think from the perspective of your, your volunteer, your group helper, the people that you're hoping that training or, or learning that you run with them is going to land and go, well, what is it that person needs to know about reporting and record keeping? Possibly not a great deal. What do they need to know about the detail of how we run DBS and PVG checks? Possibly not a great deal. What do they need to know about how and why we avoid one-to-one -one contact with children? Probably quite a lot if they're a group helper. So it's, you know, think about the individuals that you're working with and think about what their role is and what their experience is and what their level of confidence is. And maybe ask yourselves, which of these things are the things that we need to focus on? Um, I guess as a baseline, we will be suggesting that every volunteer needs to go away from any training that they do. You know, they're supposed to do safeguarding training relevant to their role, whatever their role is. Um, we would expect them to be familiar with um, what our national policy says and what procedures we have. Expect them to understand what arrangements you have to put those into practice locally, usually in your local safeguarding concerns and to know how and when to raise a concern, who to talk to, and to have the confidence and the ability to do so promptly when it's needed. So that will be, you know, that's the baseline for all volunteers, um, depending who you're working with, um, depending the age group that they are working with, depending what issues you might be dealing with in your community or within the groups, you might want to put more of an overlay on that um, and adapt what you put as you know, outcomes for those participants, um, depending on, on what you know about the group of volunteers you are training. Um, but that would be my suggestion for the baseline of, of, of what, we're, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so, you can do training in a in a wide variety of ways and i know that groups and districts will already have safeguarding training of one sort or another that they either provide for their volunteers or they access or they encourage their volunteers to access um if you're able to uh, just chip into the chat or unmute and shout out what you what you currently do how do you do training in your in your group or district at the moment with volunteers around safeguarding. Don't all shout at once. Paddy. Uh, hi, um, Paddy from uh, Clapham. Uh, we, we don't really do any formal training, but we do have a written um, piece of information that goes to adults who are okay. helping, uh, which covers hopefully the basics. Yeah. 
So a briefing note. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. That's that's a good start. Anyone do anything else currently? We tend to combine an annual session with um, a pre-camp meeting. Excellent. It's that Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Um, that's Jenny in Bristol, if I'm not much mistaken. Um, that that again, is Jenny in Bristol. That again sounds like a sounds like a good shout. A good way to good way to do it. I've got a couple of things coming in on chat. Um, Imka says encourage. Oh, Imka and Veronica both say encourage people to watch these webinars. Yeah, great. And uh, we've had uh, Ruth as well say that they uh, are running sessions on that with the young people and volunteers. Is that right, Ruth? Um, Grace, can you unlock so that people can send messages that everyone can see? Can you can you uh, speak for the that? chat? Yeah. Um, I'm, these are direct messages people have sent me. Yes. Um, but uh, Imka's just said that she can only send direct messages to the host, not to. Yeah, me too. Like okay. Me too. Um, I've just tried to unlock that to everyone. I can't guarantee that'll work, unfortunately. Let's see. Well, let's see what we can do. Um, anyway, so yeah, so a variety of different ways. Um, I mean, I thought about it possibly happening as part of people's induction, which I think is kind of what Paddy was was touching on. Um, there is the online interactive training, such as that offered by the National Youth Agency, which has a role. Um, there are leader training weekends um, or training days that are put on by um, by the staff or by um, regions and nations. Um, there is external training provided by your local authority or your sailing your, your safeguarding board. I know some groups bring in external trainers to run stuff with them and with their volunteers, um, but also potentially to run your own training for your fellow volunteers locally. Um, I remember when I when I first started like managing a team and we did a kind of um, like live management 101 um, over a series of weeks when I was working at co-op. And one of the things that really stuck with me from that um, is um, is our our trainer Sue, who was a sort of mentor for us in this little cohort of, of, of newly newly minted managers. Talked about an 80-20 rule with training. And she, she, she said, everyone always thinks that training is about going on a course or doing something like, like that. But actually, there are many other ways that in a workplace, you're going to pick up the skills that you need to do your job. And it's exactly the same with, um, with, with volunteering. And I think, for me, I think that 80-20 rule sounds about right. You might learn 20% of what you're going to know from training or induction to your role. Um, but actually, the vast majority of what you're going to learn to become a successful and adequate and safe Woodcraft volunteer is going to be through other things. So if I split that question around and said, how does learning happen? What would your answers be? Talking to people. Talking to people. Absolutely. Anything else? Personal experiences, yeah, and reflecting on those personal experiences. We do keep a training schedule and we ask people at the meetings who's watched which webinar and who's been on what course, etc. And we keep a list of that. Great. And and I didn't come didn't didn't mention that, but yeah, as as, as you know, these webinars that we've been doing on a monthly basis, uh, we record and we will we will put up on the website and the YouTube channel so people can watch them back. And we also, normally kind of manage to edit edit them down a little bit so they're slightly shorter and snappier. Um, and I nice. had a message from Ruth. Um, they apologise, their microphone isn't working, so they'll be coming to be in the chat. But um, they pair inexperienced volunteers with experienced ones as well. Yeah, so, exactly. So there are a whole range of things that are not doing training, um, which might mean that you could be learning or volunteers could be learning from one another and learning about staying safe as well as about any other area of their practice. So you might talk to other people, you might observe their practice and you might ask, that was interesting, why did you do that? Or you might run a session and go, how did that land? Um, you might shadow or work alongside someone 
who's got more experience than you. So you might you might as a district, and this is a thing that lots of districts struggle with, is this sort of, you know, it's the same people who are always KP or camp chief or whatever. Um, ask somebody to do it with you who's not confident and not as experienced. They'll have new ideas, but maybe they need a structure and a framework, and they don't just don't know what that job involves. So you could be shadowing or working alongside somebody or as the person with the experience, asking someone to shadow you or work alongside you. Taking on a new responsibility for the first time, um, as Paddy mentioned earlier, reading and reflecting on, on what you've read, whether that's a briefing note or a policy document or a case study or something like that. Um, it might just be as simple as making sure it's an agenda item on your planning meetings or your district meetings and you're revisiting it as and when. Um, and it might be that you're part of networks locally and you can share practice with with other groups or organizations um maybe you meet in a community center used by a lots of different organizations working with young people maybe you're part of a council of volunteer uh, voluntary service or, or or anything like that um Jenny says planning as a group yes just that discussion that that knowledge in the room and thinking about what could go wrong and what your plan b might be um is a really good way and talking about it in a but that you know those of us who are really experienced will always have the kind of plan b in the back of our minds but actually sometimes it's just the discipline of talking about that in advance and going and if it rains we'll do this and if the children are tired here's the route that we will cut the route cut the walk short or, or whatever and it might not have occurred to newer people that that was in the back of your mind and if you articulate it and share it and make it make it explicit then they'll know when they're doing it themselves um, which is a really good a really good shout. Um, so yeah, so other than delivering something and calling it training, um, because sometimes people say they need training or they're desperately keen to have training, more often they are aware that there's a gap in their knowledge or their skills or their confidence that they need to address, but they probably not sign up for something that was branded as a training day. Um, but what they might do is be ready to take on one of these other things to undertake one of these other activities and that way to learn what they need to learn. Um, so I guess that's just to kind of to, to, to park in your mind that, you know, delivering training is not the only way that this stuff can happen and that practice in your groups can improve over time. Um, ignore me. Right. OK. Um, however, having said that, um, we do have a tried and relatively tested and trusted uh, session plan um, that we always use as a basis for, um, for safeguarding training that we run as part of leader training weekends. Um, and very often that we use to inform a plan for a standalone training session. Um, if we're delivering that for, for a group of volunteers or going to a regional gathering or, or, or something like that. Um, we've kind of built it over time and we've we've evolved it over time, um, but the outcomes are primarily the same, however we, however we deliver it. We're trying to make sure that people are more familiar with each other in the group and with our folk as a whole. And it's important to focus, you know, to remember that that is also an outcome. Um, what you're doing when you're doing, you know, some sort of, you know, it's a group activity like any other. And what you're also trying to do is that sort of unspoken outcome of getting people confident, talking about things that are potentially a bit difficult or emotionally challenging or controversial um, and feeling comfortable with doing so and building their confidence to work alongside each other while doing it. Um, in um, the training that I've done with um, um, technologies of participation, they talk about the rational outcome and the experiential outcome. So, so there's a rational outcome, which is what you've told people that the training is about. Um, but there is always the experiential outcome, which is what do you what do you want them to gain just by being there? Um, and that's a key part of it. But other than that, the, the more rational outcomes are making sure they're able to respond to concerns, whether those are about a child or another adult, um, to be aware of all craft folk safeguarding procedures, and crucially to know where to find further resources and support. Um, the session plan that we that we use doesn't rely heavily on knowing all the answers. 
Um, and sometimes I deliver it with people who are brand new to craft folk and literally feel that they know nothing about the organization and they want to start from first principles. It's actually much harder to deliver it with a group like that. It works much better when you've got a mix of experiences in the room because the plan is designed to draw out different people's experiences and what would you do and how would you cope with that in your group and district. And the more difference in terms of approach and lived experience there is in the room, the better it works because people have more to contribute um, and it focuses on asking people to share their knowledge and experience um, rather than me or one of my colleagues as the trainer just giving people lots of information um, because that's boring and it's also not kind of particularly conducive with the way that we would work with our children and young people. Um, let's walk the talk and let's deliver a training for our adult volunteers that's every bit as participatory as it would be if we were doing a, a session with our young people. Um, so I will show you in a second just you know what, what the training outline looks like. But the thing to the thing the thing to say is that it 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 you know through the through the session plan there are a variety of different um methods of delivering the stuff so we start by thinking about all the things that put people at risk and that's a big group discussion and brainstorm with lots of flip charts um there's a little jigsaw exercise where you get people to match themselves up to their partner because they've got two halves of the same message and then they get to discuss and reflect on what it means to discuss that that what do we do to keep young people safe um there's a small group reflection that they can do around some of our safeguarding scenarios, which, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, there's another collective brainstorming session about the barriers and problem solving the barriers to people sharing their concerns or, 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 or um, worries about a child. Um, and then there's some individual reflection um, in the personal action planning to round it all off and help people to consider what action they're going to take as a result of, of being there, of being at the session. So this session sits on the um, sits on the on the website. No, that's not the right thing. Never mind. I'm going to have to come out and I'm going to just go to the website. So on the training section of the Woodcraft website, hopefully you can still see that there is the staying safe session plan, and there is here there is the actual session plan, and we've also put on as PDFs, all of the handouts and um, things that are mentioned in the text. So you can literally just run off as many of those as you have participants and deliver it as written, if that's what you want to do. If you go into the, the training resource drive using the, the link at the top of this page, um, they are also there as um, uh, Google Docs. So you can, if you want, go in and edit them and make them relevant to your own, to your own setting. Um, and you know, amend them in, in whatever way you like. Um, but the session plan, I mean, it's designed to last around two hours, um, but that involves introductions and a warm up game and the personal action planning at the end and things like that. So if you want to, you could well condense it, um, particularly with a group who really know each other, um, or you could also fit it in as part of a part of a wider um, a wider training day in amongst other sessions and other content. Um, but effectively run through the run through the the um, document you will see that there is the rough timings, there's the prompts for the trainer and what to run through, and then there's list of the resources needed. Um, but everything that you need in terms of you know, knowledge on a piece of paper to run that session is effectively on that or on the or on the on the handouts. Um, you know, you're asking people to brainstorm what they think of and you know think about risks and threats to children, young people, and flip chart it. There are potential answers that we would expect people to come out with, and some of those are on there just to make sure that you're covering on the you know, covering off the, the answers that we would expect people to come out with. But really, it's about encapsulating people's experience and knowledge. And people will bring, you know, some people have 
had extensive safeguarding training in their day jobs, whether they're you know, teachers or health workers or whatever, um, and other people will be will be new to considering it from a professional point of view. Um, and really, it's about helping the group as a whole to level up and, and, and share their knowledge and experience with each other and get to the get to a shared understanding. Um, so each of those, you know, will come with a with a um, if you need to say God in jigsaw, literally just kind of just boot it up. Um, if you you know go in and cut those, print that out and cut it up with pairs of scissors and then hand those bits out, then you know job done. And then there's a hand there's a handout afterwards which will explain the context and you can give everybody to to run through um, and have as an aid then wire afterwards. Um, so we've tried to make it as easy to take off the shelf as you can. But as I say, if you want to go in and you know reinvent that for yourself and do other things or contribute your ideas to it, then you are very welcome or in fact warmly encouraged to do so. Um, so that sits there on the training on the training um, section of the website. Um, and just going back to the slides, there we go. Um, the kind of the core of that, and one thing that we find ourselves coming back to and using again and again in different settings is the is the scenario. So there are around 20 scenarios um all of that form the kind of the heart of that and it's usually the part of that session that takes takes the longest to to deliver and discuss and, and debrief from um, so effectively with each of these there's, there's a there's a little summary um, and a series of prompt questions about you know what what's giving you concern in this situation and, and, and so on um, some of them touch on things going on in home circumstances and family life some of them touch on um, child to child abuse, which is a, a, something that we need to be vigilant for in our groups and in our wider communities. Um, some of them touch on incidents of behaviour that happens away from the group, including online behaviour. Um, some of them touch on adult volunteers and concerns about adult volunteers. Um, and between them, they cover, you know, from very young, you know, elfin age children right up to to working with DFs and young adults. Um, so they're a really good base for initiating discussions, either as part of that training. I know what some groups and districts do is they just they have those in their little group folder and they will discuss one of them at every district meeting or every planning meeting and just go as a way of almost sense checking their local safeguarding plan of going well would we know what to do if this thing happened to us um and the thing to remember with them is that they are all drawn from real experiences that have happened to real woodcrafters in this organization over the last 10 20 years um so they you know that has a that has a power um and if you look at the trainers notes you'll have not just the kind of um policy and guidance context, but we'll also have a little summary of what happened, what happened in the real case. Um, so for example, um, just here, here's, here's one of them. Um, an 11 year old turns up at your, can't spell, at your pioneer group and asks to join. He's not accompanied by his parents carers. Is it a safeguarding issue and how would you respond in your group or district? So you can have a go at that one. Give, give, me, give me a for instance. Someone tell me what would happen if that happened at your group. We've had this happen more than once. Yep. And what do you do, Jenny? To some extent, it depends a little bit where we are. Mm -hmm. It's easier to manage when you're in a building. Yep. Or particularly if you've got phone signal. So we always want to try and yep. contact the child's parents to make sure they know we've got them and who we are and all that sort of thing yep it's a lot more challenging if you're running outdoor activities in a park or something like that yep um it may be also it depends does it also depend if he's turned up if they've turned up with with a friend or if they've just 
pitched up because they've seen that there's a group and yeah. they come with no um no contact yeah they've just seen a light on and gone this looks interesting yeah i think that is i think that's that's absolutely relevant um if inca is messaging in the chat going yes yes it is a safeguarding concern um which i would i would i would endorse um and I think, I mean, this is an interesting one. It's one. It's one I quite like exploring with groups because sometimes it highlights quite a lot of difference in practice. And I think it highlights that there, you know, that difference in practice is absolutely fine. Um, and just the way that different groups are are different depending on the context in their local area. You know, in in some parts of the world, eleven year olds out in the early evening would be completely uncontroversial and, and something that happens all the time. In other places, it might be much more of an obvious sign of concern for people. Um, to me, as a pioneer leader, my response would, to this would, like Jenny, probably depend where we were. Yes, it's possibly harder to manage if we're not in a, you know, if we're in a, an outdoor session, although it's maybe, what can I say? If you're in a, if you're running a game in a, you know, a wide game in a park, actually the boundaries of what you're doing in a public space are a bit more porous, and maybe it's less of an issue that there's other people there um, who are not part of your group than it would be if there were, you know, random members of the public walking through your church hall while you're delivering your session. Um, for me, it would be also about what was the time of year. I think I would be a, a lot less concerned in the height of summer. Than I would be in the depths of winter when it's dark outside and you know raining and whatever. Um, so you can see that you can get quite a lot of mileage from um, from these and discussing what the issues are, what the considerations might be, what else you might want to find out and, and so on. Um, I'll tell you now that the the resolution of, of, of this issue is that is that the group um, allowed the, the the young person to join in their activities on that um, on that evening. Um, and the next thing they know was that the police came through the door looking for the child who had been reported missing by uh, by their parents. They hadn't know, known where it was, um, where the child was, and had contacted the police. And the police found, um, you know, found the group meeting and identified the child that they were looking for. Um, you know, an example of where something that would potentially be potentially quite a, a minor issue for some groups had been taken very seriously by the by the um, parents of the child involved and and also triggered an immediate response by the police. Um, so that's a you know that's an example of how it gets, as I said, quite a lot of mileage out of these scenarios and and often. They're not what they first seem, and that can be quite a helpful tool in terms of encouraging volunteers to reflect on the assumptions that they might make based on you know, their own parenting or based on their assumptions that they will make about a child and so on. Um, Grace has just shared. Monica says it could be a child crying out for help. Yes, you know, a child could um, you know, a child could be seeking a place of safety, seeking, seeking, you know. Um, somewhere where there are lights on and responsible adults who will be able to meet their needs. Um, and that's, you know, all of these conversations are, are really valuable and the, the, the sort that you should be having with the people that you um, are running your groups with and working with on a, a regular basis. Um, I guess building up to that question about, well, what would we do if it happened next week at Elfins? What would we do if it happened to us? And would we all agree and would we have a plan about how to respond and manage it? And, and, and I think that's, I guess, what we're drilling down to in, in, in considering these scenarios. However you use them to inspire your training, um, you know, is what would we do? Have we got a process? Would be we would we be ready to respond? Um, so even if you think that you know. The session plan that we've written is is never going to fly in your in your group and district. Um, have a look at those scenarios which are on the page, and think about how you might be able to use them to encourage 
your volunteers that you work with to to reflect and learn and discuss together um because they're, they're, they're a valuable tool and as i say more valuable because they are all real life situations um okay um so just to summarize then if you're delivering training at a local level and you know, whether you call it training or whether you call it we're just going to go and have a little bit of a plan um when you're considering safeguarding training for your volunteers by all means adapt adapt to the skill level in your um knowledge in your group adapt to the different lived experiences and adapt to what the needs and the the live issues are in your community in the community that you serve in the, in the community that your group is a part of it might be that you've got i don't know um you know significant numbers of refugee families who are attempt who are accessing your services and there are potentially additional things that you need to consider um you know signs of trauma or abuse that they might have suffered or signs of them not having their basic needs met and that's going to be uppermost in your mind it might be that you work in an area where there is a significant amount of youth violence and your young people are at risk and you might want to think about how you're going to respond to that you you know by all means adapt to your you know we are we can provide you with examples of what other groups have done and what our policies say you are the experts in your children your young people and your community um so, so don't be afraid of that um reflect on on your own experiences and practice um particularly those of you who had a long association with this organization and will have been able to see you know how not just issues have been managed in the moment but how they've played out in the long term um reflect on experiences and practice that people have got from from other walks of life as well whether they're working in schools or in other youth work settings and and, and so on um i would always suggest that you kind of try and make and build in space for people to step away um and give you know make people aware that you might be discussing things that could be difficult or traumatic um if i'm doing it as part of a leader training weekend i normally kind of you know, doing it at knockerbrook or something we've, we've often got a kind of you know either a walk or a, a you know a, a longer break in the afternoon i try to schedule this for just before that so that actually if people need to just go and decompress and walk on the hills for a bit afterwards they have got that chance um that might be harder in the context of you know running something in parallel with the group life. but make it clear that you know if people just need to step back from it for a moment to get some space whatever that they're welcome to do that um the other thing that often happens is that you sort of you know you go through all these things and you say and this could be a sign of abuse or neglect happening within the family home or um you know and there was this time when this happened and, and this was the consequence and suddenly it starts cogs whirring in, in people's minds and they come up to you afterwards and say, just wanted to pick up on that thing because I saw this thing the other day. So sometimes running a session like this does trigger people to share a concern, which is great. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, but maybe thinking about if you are the local safeguarding lead, um, making sure that you are building in the opportunity for people to come and approach you afterwards and, and have a confidential word or, or, or whatever. Um, so that, you know, that's just about kind of the space that you make around it and the space that you hold around it um, can sometimes be as important as what you actually say. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can, rather than go, right, everybody, we're going to do a training session on Thursday night at seven o'clock, you can just build it into your own planning uh, you can also build reflecting on some of these scenarios or um re-looking at you know um some of the some of the resources and handouts and things into your own kind of ordinary review of the ways that you're working so when you're looking at your risk assessments and updating them when you're looking at your local safeguarding plan and making sure it still fits the purpose um maybe that's the time to just run through a scenario and go would this eventuality be covered by our um by our current processes or um sometimes often the best 
updates to people's um, safeguarding plans and risk assessments happen, happens in hindsight. So either you've had an incident or, or you've had an accident or you've had a near miss and we go, well, hang on a minute, was, was the risk assessment working or was it just that we weren't following it? And that's where it's really important to tease out the learning and that reflection. Um, and I suppose the final thing I'd say is about is about where do the children and young people fit in this? Because yes, we're trying to make an environment where adults have got the skills and the knowledge and the understanding and the attitudes to provide a safe place for children and young people. But we're also trying to equip children and young people to be safe in the world and in their world and in their relationships and in their community. So by all means, run training and support for your volunteers, but also think about where you train and educate your young people. Um, I'd encourage every group to be doing stuff that touches on as part of their group program, you know, how young people stay safe, whether that is about, you know, using the, the pants resources that the NSPCC develop about you know, giving children the equipment, you know, the the, um, the resilience to know which parts of their body are private and sh and speak up when they feel that people are doing things that they're uncomfortable with, which is a really important part of building safe and resilient young people. Whether you're working with older young people about what safe and healthy and consensual relationships look like, build that stuff into your group program for your children and young people as much as you build it into your training and development for your volunteer workforce. Um, and particularly if you're working with you know, venturers into DFs, into young adults, bear in mind that people could be, you know, both beneficiaries, group members, but also taking on leadership and, and volunteering roles as well um, and help them to smooth that transition um, and think about what they have to do differently when they're coming to a craft activity with a volunteering hat on rather than as a, as a child or young person who's been accessing the, 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 the provision, the organisation. Um, so those are just some things that you might like to think about um, if you're considering what you, can, what you can do and provide locally. Um, if you do nothing else when you run training for your volunteers, please, please, please make sure that they go away having received some really key messages, which is that their primary role in keeping young people safe at Woodcraft um, is to share any and all concerns, even if they think it's probably nothing, with their local safeguarding lead, because that's how we make sure that we build up the picture and we keep everybody safe. Um, that might be a worry about an individual child, that might be an in, another adult behaving inappropriately, it might be the procedures that we have to keep people safe not being followed. Um, but a culture where we are always sharing that stuff routinely, not because we're constantly looking, you know, keeping watch on each other and, and, and telling tales, but because we are part of a community where we are coming together to do something that is challenging and radical, and we need to hold each other positively to account. Um, and take a shared responsibility for the safety of our children and young people, but also of our community. Um, so they need to know what they should be sharing, um, but also how to do it. Um, if they have immediate fears for the safety of a young person, contact the police. For everything else, it's that local safeguarding lead that they should have identified for their group, or for their project or their centre, if they're volunteering at one of our outdoor centres. And then the confidence that there is a process and that flow chart that, um, that's, in the, that's in the handout packs um, demonstrates this quite well, um, that you know, they funnel their information into their local safeguarding lead, who will then take advice from me or one of my colleagues if needed, and then you know, decide which of the possible outcomes um, we're going to follow. Um, and also that we record and, and keep a record of that so that we can build up a picture over time if there is a you know uh, an issue that is bubbling on the first time it occurs it's not an immediate cause of concern once it becomes an established pattern of behavior and um, you know that child is always turning up hungry at the group that's when we start to be 
start to be concerned. Um, so if you send them away with nothing else, knowing, as I mentioned at the top, what sort of concerns they should be on the lookout for and what to do if they feel that there's something that they need that they need to share. Um, just finally, I would say, you know, think about other resources that might help you. So the, the National Youth Agency have recently launched their safeguarding hub. Um, it's you know, designed to support youth organisations across the UK. Um, but there's lots of ideas and good practice and things on there that you can have a look at in addition to this, this short online training module that I would um, strongly encourage particularly group coordinators and local safeguarding leads to do um, and run through uh, just to give yourself a refresher on the, on, on the basics, on the you know, signs and symptoms of abuse um, and on the referral routes that you should be familiar with locally. Um, the NSPCC also have some very good resources. They have resources that you can use directly with children and young people, as well as um, training and, and, and development activities for themselves. There are some paid for courses, there's some online learning, um, but have a look at their site and use it to either do stuff with them or, or possibly to, to just inform your own processes. Um, there's an email that you can sign up for, um, which is called CASPAR. It's a weekly email. It's something like um, current, I forgot what it stands for, but it's basically a roundup of current um, practice and research. Uh, that's what the PAR stands for. Um, but it's basically, you know, this organisation has produced a report into this. This organisation has produced, uh, you know, a, published a new toolkit that you can use with young people to explore this. And it's all connected to safeguarding in its wider sense. Um, some of it will be very, very directly relevant to our group, some of it less so, but nonetheless interesting in terms of what's going on from a kind of policy and procedure um, perspective. Um, sometimes the, you know, things that manifest as safeguarding concerns within our groups can sometimes be more about a lack of structure and a lack of shared understanding about how volunteers work together and if that's the feeling that you're that you're getting um the working together training program which was um produced for us a while ago by the co-op college um is a really good thing that you can do as a group of volunteers to identify and um kind of you know encapsulate that shared practice and shared understanding um, so I'd urge you to have a look at that if if your if your feeling is that actually what you need to do is develop and build a shared understanding as a as a group of volunteers before you can then do the kind of performing and um, you know delivering part of your your kind of group life cycle. Um, and then also finally your local authority or your local safeguarding partnership, um, particularly for you as safeguarding leads because one of your accountabilities is to be more familiar and be able to signpost people to the appropriate kind of processes and, lo and, and resources locally um, then doing doing something with your local authority um, or your local safeguarding partnership or at least being aware of their um, their training offer as well um, can, can be very helpful um, one of the advantages if you've got a local authority who are still doing in-person um, safeguarding training that's free to access is that you do come into contact with other you know um, statutory and third sector um, providers at those training courses um, which particularly if you're somewhere where there are kind of complex community issues or you know street violence or other things that you need to be aware of that actually you can sometimes make get interesting perspectives and make useful contacts that can can help you deal with that um, just through the networking that happens on the fringe of, of those of those trainings as well. So do check out your local safeguarding partnership and what their training offer is like. I have to say it is it it's variable from from local authority to local authority. But if you've got somewhere that's still investing heavily in training, particularly for the third sector, then grab it with both hands because it's usually very helpful. Um, that was all I had. Um, so. I'm very happy to stay online and ask to answer any questions that people have got or comments they want to raise directly. But equally, I'm very happy for you to reach out to me afterwards and, and you know, ask me something that you really want to air in a, um, in a public forum. Um,
you do have questions, unmute now or bang it in the chat, sharpish. Stunned you all into silence. Um, uh, thanks, that was really useful. Yeah, that's all what I wanted to say. Um, it's it's really good to have a review and it's made me think about how we should be um, trying to make sure that our volunteers are, are engaged. Um, right. Thank you, Paddy. You can come again. <laughs> Don't hold it on a Thursday if you want us to come again. Yeah, I mean, we do, we do try and we do try and dot these around. <laughs> you know, it would be tempting to have it on a... Yeah. Mm at the same slot each week, but I'm, I'm aware that that will always disenfranchise the same people. Um, <laughs> I have to say, if you're leaning on me to deliver them, it's unlikely to be on a Thursday because that's when I'm up to my ears in Pioneers. So. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Okay, shoot. It's not quite a safeguarding trainer's question, but could I have a quick reminder on what information is available to us in group to check adult memberships and DBSs? Yeah, I can take this one. That's one for you, Grace. Yeah, so uh, in group, uh, if you're a membership secretary, uh, you'll have access to those who are listed in your group um, or district on group. Um, and under that, it will have uh, your Woodcroft membership expiry date for each of those members, as well as uh, their DBS uh, expiry as well. That is what you should be able to see. If you can't, do drop me uh, an email, um, grace at woodcraft.org.uk. As long as you do it in the next, what, four days? Uh, in the next three working days. My, three working days. I, I leave the team for Pastures New on Friday. So, um, so once, once, once Grace is off, is off the scene, the membership at woodcraft.org.uk is usually your best route to get a response from one of the team. It might be it might be Leanne, who is now back at her desk, or it might be Rosie, who is our new membership. Um, or it might be me. Or it might be Veronica with her other volunteering hat on, um, yeah. who's doing a lot behind the scenes to, to keep our, our um, member information up to date, for which we are eternally grateful, Veronica. Have I told you that lately? <laughs> Follow-up question then. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, within our district, we've got a huge number of people in the, this is in the group district, yes. who haven't been active and whose membership lapsed a long, long time ago. Are we okay to just archive those if we know they're not people that are currently active? Yes, Jenny, that's absolutely I mean, correct. Hang on. If if they're I mean if they're actively paying if they're still paying a subscription yeah. to the organization, I would prefer you that they're not archive, but those that are out of date and are no longer paying, I would say archive. Yeah. But if, if they're actively if they're people who are, you know, keeping keeping paying because they're they're supporting us and they think they're being helpful by giving us money and staying on group. Um, they absolutely are being helpful by giving us money. They're not being helpful by staying on group. And actually, if we can flag those as friends of the folk rather than archiving them, that would be great because then we can start talking to them as if they are valuable financial donors rather than chasing them to renew our renew their DBSs and come to webinars like this because we know that's not what they want to do. Um, Can I best, do that? That's what's something the best I... way for that to happen? I don't know whether this is a Grace or a Veronica question. Um, uh, so, um, you know, if you've got a list of those people, um, do send them over to either the memberships at email address I popped in the chat or to myself, um, and we can, we can go through those and help you to archive those people that need to be, or equally look at sort of tagging those people, if you like, as friends of folk to make sure that they're getting the information that's relevant to them. Cool. Brilliant. Um, I wonder, Grace, it's possibly worth just mentioning that we have earmarked the next of these monthly sessions to be a um, refresher on DBS and screening as people begin to think of coming out of 
hibernation and going camping again and doing that sort of thing um yes so um that is likely to be the next safeguarding session i'm putting the final touches this week on our sort of program of events for the next uh season for summer season so um you can expect an email before the end of the week um outlining what's to come and that will likely be presented by uh leanne or another member of the team for that one Real. Okay. thank you that's great um Susie, did I see you just unmute and be about to ask a question or? No, I wasn't going to ask a question. I was going to thank you. <laughs> so I didn't want to interrupt the questions because I was adding thanks, because I think every time you I attend one of these, it kind of makes me think about what we've done with, with the group and we've done some of the scenario stuff. And what more we could do? Um, I don't. We certainly didn't use all the scenarios. And how often? How, well, how long ago that probably was? So when we need to refresh and things. So, thank you. It. It. I find these very. They focus the mind. So thank you. Sure. And well, there's always that, so much to learn as well. I mean, that, that's that's what that's what we're aiming for. But I hope I, I, I'm glad it's I'm glad it's been helpful. I mean, just a word on those scenarios. I would say okay. you know, if I you love are the, working. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I said I love this format. It's so accessible Excellent. being on Zoom. Thank you. Um, Lovely thing. Yeah, just, just a word on the on the scenarios. I mean, if you are training, you know, a group of predominantly Elfin leaders, you know, there are enough Elfin sessions in Elfin scenarios in there to keep people <laughs> busy for for a, for a session. Don't feel that you have to use absolutely every single one of them. Because actually, the ones about the ones about venturers and DFs will probably put the fear of God into them. Um, yeah, and I'm actually venturers, and um, and it was interesting thinking about the talking with the venturers themselves and involving the yeah. venturers and and how they're safe in life and going forward. I think that was really helpful thought as well. Thank you. Good, excellent. I'm glad. Um, um, some feedback from Monica in the chat, Owen. She uh, says, thank you. Um, they've only just started in the role and they'll carry on with the training and additional safeguarding courses next. Real. Um, that's great. Um, Jenny, I will send you some links um, offline um, in response to the query that you've just flagged to me. Um, other than that, I will say thank you very much for your attendance and your attention over the last hour. Um, and almost bang on eight o'clock, I wish you good evening. Um, well, I'm the same to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.